Hey, what's up, Nerdgasm fans? Jerry here, a.k.a. Barnacles. You guys ready for another episode of... Foodgasm. You guys really liked the first episode, so here comes the second. I'm gonna warn you up front, though. It's a little long, and the ADHD was strong on this one, so just hang in there with me. All right, guys, we're going to dive right into today's project. Now, I received a ton of feedback from you guys, and it was excellent, and it's going to help me improve this series immensely. A couple of things that I'll show you right off the bat is notice I have a larger mouse cursor now, and I bound the control key to put a little circle around it. See that? So now you guys can actually see where the mouse cursor is. Now, I've made several other changes throughout the video that I'll let you know as I'm implementing them, and I want you guys to know that I'm actually taking your feedback. It's helping a lot, especially since so many people really enjoyed this. So let's go ahead and start off by just opening Visual Studio. Now, this brings up a point from the previous video. A lot of people said that my face, yeah, this thing right here was covering up too much of the screen. So because of that, we need to say bye-bye to my face. You guys will just have to get by on my voice alone. I don't know what to tell you. Bye, Barnacles. All right, that's better. Now, now you guys can see way more of the screen here. All right, so I've decided today I want to introduce a couple of other new concepts in programming. And just like the first video, I want to do it in a way that, that piques interest, and I'm not going to go into great detail on anything. If you guys have questions, you can come over and ask me on Twitter, or you can use the links in the description to basically go get further education. The goal of this is to make you guys dangerous and get you involved. And then you guys can go figure out the rest. All right, so let's start off by creating a new project. You can either click new project right here or you can come up to file and say new project. Now, a lot of people were complaining that they weren't getting all the options that they saw in the previous video. And that's because they were selecting a visual basic project or a visual C++ project. Make sure for this entire video series that you're selecting visual C sharp, Windows and console application. This is critically important. All right, let's go ahead and give it a name. We're going to call this the magic eight ball. App. I mean, that's that's pretty easy and straightforward. Now, if you watch the first video, you'll already be familiar with this. Just like we said before, I'll give you a little bit of a refresher. This thing is called a namespace. It's a container. It contains things. This namespace basically says that Magic 8-Ball owns everything that's between those two brackets. Now, this is a class. A class is an object. And just to make it easier for you guys, some more feedback I got was the text was too small. <gasps> oh, my God. Now, the text is big. Look at that. Oh, see your feedback at work. So now we have class program. Remember, everything between this bracket and this bracket belongs to program. Now, an object is, this is what this is, they call it a class, it's also referred to as an object, basically it's just a group of functionality. Think of these things as buckets, right? This is the earth, this is the continent, this is the state, or region, or whatever you call it, wherever you are in the world. And this is a function, this is a class, this is the namespace. All right, so we got the fundamentals there. Now, a lot of people were really confused because I didn't tell them what static means right here. And I didn't tell you which void means because they weren't really necessary in the previous video. But for this video, I wanna let you know because we actually are going to be playing around with this a little bit. So what I wanna to do to give you guys kind of an example here is I wanna explain what an object is. Other than just being a container, see this is just a program, it contains some things. We're gonna create another class. You can call them literally whatever you want. We're gonna call this object Jerry. This is an object representing me. Now generally when you create an object, you don't create something so specific as Jerry. You would create something like a human ah, and you would give him the attributes of Jerry. But for the argument of this video, we're gonna just call it Jerry and make it easy. Now let's say I create a couple variables. Name equals Jerry, because that's my name. A string alias equals Barnacles, because that's my alias. All right, so you with me so far here? So I'm creating a couple little objects here and let's do int age equals 34. All right, so now here is where the static comes into the play. Right now, if I try to come down here and use the Jerry object, watch what happens. Dot. All I get is an equals and reference equals. I, I can't touch anything inside of that object. Well, that's because in order to touch anything in that object, I would have to create an instance of it. So I would have to say Jerry, J1 equals new Jerry. Now that created one instance of Jerry. And then I can do Jerry J2 equals new Jerry. And that'll create two instances. So now J1 and J2 are separate instances of Jerry. And if we come up here and we make these public, uh, this is a new modifier you guys are gonna learn. If you type public, you're basically saying 
that anything outside of these two brackets can access any of these variables. By default, you can't access them. Now notice, because I put public on those, if I come down here and try to access, say, J1, now I get age, you see right here, age, alias, and name. I can now modify those. I can change my age, right? So that's cool. Well, that actually isn't that cool because you don't want to be able to change my name and my age because this is the Jerry object. So what you do instead is you put private or you don't put anything. If you don't put anything, it's just considered private by default. So let's say my alias can be changed. Let's just make alias public. So now you have a private name, a private age, and an alias. Now what this does is if I come down here and try to access it, what's gonna happen? All I can access is my alias. Now I can say my new alias is new Barnacles. There's a lot going on here in this concept, but I just wanna get it to the point where you guys can just see how it's working. Now you understand how the private and public stuff works, but now I'm gonna explain static. Now let's say I come up here and I type, sorry, I type static, 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 and actually, generally, you want the access modifier to be first. So let's let's switch those around. All right, so now you have private static string, public static string, and private static int for my name agent. But watch, watch what's gonna happen here now. Notice how this has a red squiggly line under it? It's like, I don't know what an alias is. So if I come down here and I type J1, look, I have access to nothing. Well, here's the cool part, is when you say static, you're basically saying that you wanna access the just the standalone instance of that object. You get it for free. So now if I just type Jerry, I don't have to create an instance. I just type Jerry. And now see, I can modify my alias because it's public and it's static. So I don't have to create an instance. Notice when I create that instance, I can't do anything with it. There's, there's, there's nothing I can do with it. So I have to access the one instance because I'm one of a kind. There's only one Jerry. So by creating this as static, I'm actually, and I can actually do something called abstract here that'll actually prevent it. So you can't even create an instance. If you try to create an instance of Jerry now, equals new Jerry, watch what happens. You get a red squiggly, because you can't do that. So abstract isn't important to this lesson, but abstract is basically saying that this can, there is only one Jerry, and static is saying that this is his name, alias and age, and they're only accessible on this main object. There's, there's, you don't have to create an instance of it. Now we're not gonna be using this piece of code in the program, so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and comment that out. You can come up here and click on this little thing here, or you can do control E followed by C, that's also called a chord, and it'll comment it out. And that way later on, if we wanna bring that code back, we can. It's better than deleting it and having to rewrite it later. When you're ready to release your application, then you go ahead and pull out all the commented code. All right, so here's our program. This is gonna be the magic eight ball. So let's go ahead and just call our program here. Uh, let's see here, entry. Entry point for Magic 8-Ball Program by Barnacles. All right. All right, so the very first thing we're gonna do in our application is we're gonna go ahead and tell the user what we're running. To do that, we just do console write line. You guys would remember that from the previous application. We're gonna say Magic 8-Ball by Barnacles. That simple. Remember, all strings have to be in quotes, and you always use a semicolon to end your statement. That basically tells the little compiler thing when it's building your program that this is one operation. Run this and then move to the next. Now, a lot of people were talking about console color. How do I change the color of my text? Surprisingly, a lot of people were interested in that. Well, it's very easy, actually, because console is a static object, like we said. So we can just hit period. You can see we can access all this cool stuff right off console. We don't have to create an instance of it. We just get it. One such thing is foreground color. Now, if you just hit space followed by equals, you get IntelliSense takes you right to the object type because remember, Foreground color is an object type. You can see there, it's a console color. So we can only feed it a console color. And if we hit period again, we get all the color choices. And these literally are all of them. So don't, don't ask if there's more, because there's not. So let's go ahead with something cool. Let's do, uh, let's do like dark yellow. So now, if you look at our application, we basically say change the foreground color to dark yellow and then write a line. Now, if we run this by hitting Control F5 or going up to build and then doing build solution and then doing debug, start debugging. And you can start, actually, we want to do start without debugging. Sorry, this one right here. Control F5 is my shortcut. When we run it, watch what happens. Notice the text right here is dark yellow. If we come over here and we change it to something else like, let's do green, Control F5. We now have green text. Now, just to be a good citizen, what's gonna happen is if you run this program just like this from the command line, 
you're going to change the color of the entire command line. When your program stops, everything's still going to be green. So to be a good citizen, we're going to actually store the current console color so that we can restore it when we're done. The way we do that is we create a console color object. We give it a name. We'll call it old color. And we're going to make it equal to console color, or sorry, console.foreground color, because this contains the current color, whatever it is when the application starts. And now we've stored it. So now what we're going to do down here is we're going to restore it at the end. So let's just say, uh, let's see, cleaning up. We'll just put a little comment down here. We're going to set the console.foreground color to our old color. It's that simple. And that'll put it back to the old color before leaving the application. So change console text color. And we put comments on everything. Sorry, that goes right there. And then up here, we do preserve current console text color. All right, it's just a nice thing to do, guys. And another thing is, is you can actually change the color for every single character if you want. I can literally, let's say we just want the M to be green. I can just say right. Remember, you don't want right line. You just want right if you don't want it to go to the next line right after printing. So now we'll do console right line right after this with the rest of the string. And we're going to change the color in between. So console foreground color equals console foreground color. Uh, let's do dark green like that. Now, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to do this. Notice how the first letter is bright green and all the rest of the letters are dark green. I know, pretty cool, huh? And we're going to have a lot of fun with this later using random numbers. All right, so there we go. We got magic eight ball. Let's go ahead and leave that. Now, in our previous application, I showed you guys what functions do. Now, what functions do is they group together a whole bunch of this thing into one like place where you call one thing and it runs all this code. It saves you from having to rewrite the code over and over again. So let's just say that we want to make this a function. Let's cut it. So I do control X and it just cuts it. You can also right click and say cut. And we're gonna come down here and create another function. We're gonna call it static. Remember, you have to call it static. Otherwise we can't call it because we'd have to create an instance of program to call it. So just make everything static for now. And it's not gonna return anything. And we're just gonna say, tell people what program this is. Now, normally you don't name functions ridiculously long names, but I want this to be self-explanatory. And we'll create a comment on it saying, this will print the name of the program and who created it to the console. All right, cool. So all we're gonna do is paste that code in there. Notice I didn't do anything different. I just came down here and pasted that code. Now we can take this function and put it right here. It's that simple. Notice now, now if I want, I can run that function four times. What do you think this is gonna do? We're gonna get the name of the program four times in a row. See, so you keep reusing code and this goes back to the analogy I was using with the hammer. You basically take the components of the hammer to build the hammer and then you use the hammer to build something bigger and then you use that tool that you built with the hammer to build something bigger. All right, well, we only need to tell the user once. So we're gonna say, hey, tell what program this is. All right, the next thing is we need the magic eight ball code. Hey, well, I'm explaining this. I'll even turn the video back on for you guys. So the magic eight ball, you know, you shake it, you shake it, you shake it, you ask it a question and it, something floats up in it and it basically gives you an answer to yes or no related questions. We're basically gonna emulate the magic eight ball in this application and you guys can decide how to modify it to make it something way cooler. All right, Jerry, get the hell off the screen. Okay, so the first thing we need to do in the Magic 8-Ball application is we need to ask the user a question, right? Because obviously you need to be able to type in a question, otherwise how the hell is it gonna be able to answer you? So to do that, we're gonna go ahead and do a console write. Now notice I did write and I did not do write line. The reason for that is I don't want it to go to the next line because I want the user to type in the text after these words, not on the next line. So let's go ahead and type, ask a question. We'll put a little colon right there and a space then end it. Now that's just gonna print, ask a question. We're gonna run it again. You can see right there, it says ask a question. Now it says press any key to continue because it went to the end of the application. Nothing was stopping it, so it just ran to completion. So I also want it to be a different color. So let's do console, uh, console.foreground color. And for our question, we'll do, uh, we'll do white. Like so. Now you can see it says ask a question and bright white. Okay, so now we're gonna do a console.readline. This is gonna basically ask the user for a line of text, but we need to put it somewhere because we need to, technically we don't need to know what the question is because the magic eight ball is actually a total trick based on random numbers, but let's store it so that we can do something cool with it later. So string, question string equals console read line. So now when I run this program, it's gonna ask me for a question. You can see I'm typing in the text after the colon. 
So that's my question. As soon as I hit enter, the program exits. And that's because it runs down here, it restores the foreground color, and you're out. You're done. So now we need to do something with that read line. And also, just to make it a little more fun, I'm going to change the console color yet again. Let's do uh, dark gray. So now when you ask your question, it's a different color. So now you can see we've got green, we've got white, we've got gray. It's cool, especially later on when we create something like a text-based adventure. This is just going to make things really neat. Okay, now another cool thing about programming like this is notice I keep compiling the application and running it so I can see if it's doing what I want it to do. Feel free to do that. Don't write a bunch of code and then wonder why it doesn't work. Test it continuously. Also, down here in this area, if you have an error, like for instance, let me just make a mistake. I'm just going to do red, red align. See this red line right here? If you mouse over it, it says system console doesn't contain a definition for that. That basically means that function doesn't exist. You spelled it wrong. And you come down here, you can see there's a list of errors down here. And it'll list all the errors in your program and you can double click them and it takes you right to them. But it's better to catch the errors early because if you have an error in 20 different places, it's going to be very confusing to figure out which ones are causing the other ones. So, so compile your code frequently, as frequently as possible. All right, so we got our question. So we're going to go ahead and just leave a comment right here. We're going to say... This block of code will ask the user for a question and store the answer or store the question text in question string variable. All righty then, moving to the next line down here. Okay, so we got to do something with this question. So now we're going to introduce something completely new that we haven't done before, something called a while loop. Now remember in our last application we actually did a loop, but it was a for loop. Well, this is a while loop. So what while means is while whatever's between this point and this point right here is true, keep running what's inside of here. So I'm going to create something called an infinite loop. So if I say while true, that basically means loop this code forever. Never stop looping this code ever. Loop forever and ever. Er, er. Okay. So that's, that's what we're doing right here. We're creating a loop. The reason being is we want to be able to ask the user multiple questions. We want to keep going back and asking more questions. We don't want to just exit after one answer. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to grab all this code. I'm going to cut it out and I'm going to stick it right here like that. Okay, now what's going to happen when I run this code? Because remember, the program stops running when I call read line until I press enter. So if we run this right now. All right, so you guys can see what's going on here. Let me show you how to do this. On the console window, if you want to change it, just go to properties go over to font and you can actually increase the size of the font and you can also go over and increase the width of the window. Well, like, let's go ahead and make it a little bit wider and let's make it a little bit longer. That way you guys can see what the hell's going on here. All right. Actually, that's probably a little overkill. Let's make it like that. There we go. All right. So it says, ask a question. So, uh, do you think Barnacles is the best? Ask a question. I just did. Ask a question. What the fuck. All right. As you can see there, it's 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 not working, right? It's not it's not doing anything. It's just looping. It keeps asking the question, and we never get anywhere. Okay. Well, that that's a boring application. Let's go ahead and kill that. So what we need to do is do something with that with that answer. So now what we need to do is create a random number, just like rolling dice, right? The whole idea of this program is it just picks a random answer and returns it to you. It's not actually analyzing your question. It doesn't care what your question is. So to do that, we create something called a random object. And we'll just go ahead and just call it R for a single letter. Actually, let's make it easier. I'll just say random object equals new random. Now, what this is going to do is create an instance. Now, remember earlier I said not static means you just use that. Non-static means you have to create an instance of it. So if I wanted to have like four instances, I could just do this and have random object one, two, and three. And then I could use them all independently and they wouldn't interfere with each other. We only need one though. So we have random object. So... Create a randomizer object. The sole purpose of this object is to return random numbers. That's it. So just to give you a little demo here, we'll do console right line. And then inside of here, we're just going to do our little token. Remember what this means from the first lesson. It says take whatever is after this little comma and replace it right there. So we're going to say random object, next. And then inside the next, it takes a, a value. You're basically saying what range of numbers do you want to return a random number from? I'm going to put in 10. So what this is going to do is this going to return a number between 0 and 9. So what I can do if I want is just add plus 1 to the end. See how all I did was just add plus 1. Now that's going to generate a number between 1 and 10 because if it generates a 0, it's going to add 1 to it and make it a 1. If it generates a 9, it's going to add 1 to it and make it a 10. So I'll give you a little example of that. Now every time we push this, you're going to get a different number. 
see that? Eight, four, two, three, seven, ten, five, six. These are all, these are completely random numbers. All right, so now you guys know what the random number generator does. Now we need to put it to use. We need to basically convert that number into a yes or no response. And also we're gonna make a couple of changes here really quick. See the random object? We're gonna move it. We're gonna move it outside of the while loop. And by outside, I mean up above it here. The reason for this is, is I only wanna generate this object once. If I generate it inside of this while loop, what's gonna happen every single time it goes through here? It's gonna create a new object, create a new object. That's inefficient, you don't wanna do that. If we know we're gonna be using this object throughout the program, we wanna create it at a point where that's what's gonna happen. We don't wanna keep deleting it and recreating it. And just so you guys know, anytime you leave the bracket, so this code is running, as soon as I get down here and I'm outside of that bracket, this no longer exists. This goes away. Question string is dead at that point. All right, so now inside of our while loop, we ask a question. So we need to get a random number. So let's just say, uh, we'll just int random. That's our little function. Well, actually, let me just spell these out for you guys. So ran random number equals random object dot next. And we'll say, let, let's start with four answers. So zero through three. So get a random number. That's all we're doing right there. So now we have the random number, so what do we wanna do with it? Now, we could do the if thing. Like, remember in the first project, we, we could say if random number equals zero, then do this. Now, there's an alternative called a switch statement. And what a switch is, it's just like a whole bunch of light switches, right? You turn on the switch that actually matches what you wanna do. So to make a switch statement, all you do is you type switch, and then inside of it, you put random number, because remember, that's this guy right here. We generate the random number, we're passing it into the switch statement. Then again, you create a scope, and then you create things called cases, and these are basically the switches inside of the switch statement. So you say case zero, like that, case one, case two, so that's it, we have three cases. And then what you do is you can put these little brackets here. You don't have to though, this is kind of a little gotcha in the language, you don't have to use the brackets on case statements, but I, I actually prefer to use them just because it makes it look cleaner. Now, what you have to do is once the code runs, so let's say random number is zero, it's gonna run this code. If random number is one, it's gonna run this code. But the problem is, as soon as it's done running that code, it's gonna run that code, that code, that code, that code. So we use something called break. And you put that at the end. The reason why you do this is break, anytime you say break, you say jump outside of these brackets. So when I say break, it's gonna automatically jump over all that code down there, and it's gonna end up down here, and that's what we wanna do. So we're gonna put breaks in all of these. All right, so we have our little code blocks here. We got our switches wired up, so now we need some code. So let's say if it picks a zero. We're gonna do console right line. Yes, that's our answer. Zero is yes. One is no. Two is hell no. And three is Oh my God, yes. So now we've got a couple different variations of yes and no on our magic eight ball. So now if I run this program, this is what's gonna happen. Ask a question, am I pretty? Oh my God, yes, see, you can already tell it's working. Do you think Barnacle's Nerdgasm is the best channel on all of YouTube and beyond? Yes, oh man, this thing's batting a thousand. Am I rich? Oh my God, yes, good, good, good. This thing, this thing, I'm. And my poor people, hell no. See, wow, this thing's actually way more accurate than I thought, but we have a problem. And the problem is it's gonna keep asking questions forever. And even if you hit enter and you don't ask a question, it's gonna give us an answer. So that's, that's bad form, right? It's just, it's just giving us answers to nothing. So we have to do a couple things. We have, to, we have to polish this turd a little bit. So first, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's put some comments in here. Let's come up here and say, uh, use, just put a comment here, use random number to determine response. All right, so what we need to do now is do a couple checks. Before we get here, let's do a couple checks and make sure that the question is even something that we're interested in. Oh, let's do if question string to lower. This means convert it to lower case because this is a case sensitive language. If you type something, um, if, if you try to compare two strings and one has capitals and one doesn't have capitals, they're not gonna equal each other. So we have to convert it to lowercase, and then we compare it to something like quit. All right, so see if the user typed quit as the question. Ah! 
All right, so now if the user type quit, what do we wanna do? We wanna get out of this application. So we're just gonna type break, because remember what break does? It's gonna cause it to jump out of the while loop because that's what it's inside of. So the break's gonna drop out of that loop. So if we go down and we look, it's gonna pop us out right here. And then it's gonna change the console color back and exit the application. So now we've added that. So now if we open up the program and we start typing, let's just ask a bunch of questions. Yes, yes, oh my God, no, no, hell no, hell no. What happens if I type quit? Boom, I'm out of the application. So now we've put in a mechanism to close the application, which is important. All right, now we need to check and see if a question is even being asked. So if question string length dot length is equal to zero, you do double equals because double equals means to compare. A single equals means to make equal to. So double equals means compare. So if the question string equals zero, then we want to do console right line. You need to type a question full like that. That's all we want to do, except for what's going to happen if we run this. Well, the problem is, as soon as we run this, it's just going to basically go down and give you an answer. And we don't want it to give an answer because you didn't give a question. And we don't want to use break because what happens if we put break right here? It's going to break out of that loop and exit the application. So there is a new thing I'm going to show you. It's called continue. Now, what continue does is it jumps all the way down to the end of the loop, which is right here. And let me put a comment. This is the end of the while loop. And what it does is it goes all the way back up to the top and starts, starts over again right there. So continue means just don't run any more code in that loop. Go back to the beginning and start over. So now if we run this, this is what's going to happen. Am I handsome? Handum. <laughs> Apparently I'm handum, guys. But watch what happens if I don't ask a question. You need to type a question fool. Notice it's not giving me an answer. It's just giving me that text and going back through the loop. You have to ask a question to get an answer. Perfect. This is cleaning up the program. The program is becoming more functional. We can even put a joke in there if we want to. We can say if question string to lower equals equals you suck. Console right line. You suck even more by and then we're going to type break. So now we added a joke. If the user insults with you suck, smack them and close app. All right. So now it's going to basically just print that to them and then get out of the loop, which is going to change the console color back and exit the application. So let's run it. So you suck. Boom. You suck even more. Bye. And it kicks you out. So you can see you can add as much of that as you want. So now we have the core foundation for our little program and we added some additional things in there. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to break these out into functions to make the code a little cleaner. What we're going to do up here at the top is we have this code that asks for a question and gets the text back, right? So that's what this does. That block of code asks for the question and gets the text back. So let's go ahead and cut that out. And we're going to come down here and create a new function right under here. So static void, except for notice we're not going to use void because we, we want to get the question text back. So I'm going to make the string instead of void and say, get question from user like this. And now I've created this function. I'm going to put a comment on there. This function will return the text the user types. That's all it does. Paste that code in there. And then what we do is we return it. So at the very end, what we're going to do here is type return question string. What this means is I want to take the value that's stored in there, which is ultimately what the user types in, and I want to return it in place of this. So anything that I say variable equals get question from user, that variable at the end is going to equal whatever comes out of this. Hope that makes sense. I know this can, this can probably be a little overwhelming. Go back and watch it. See how it works. It will make sense. So now we've got get question for user. So let's go up here at the top where we cut that code out. And notice there's red lines everywhere. It's because get que question string doesn't exist. It hasn't been created. So we need to create a new one. So string question string equals and then we put the name of that function just like that. Now this creates question string. This is going to run get question from user, which you have to type and hit enter. As soon as you hit enter, then question string contains the value. So if we hit F5, type question. Hey, oh my God, yes. Hey, oh my God, yes. Hey, you suck. Boom, we got kicked out. So notice now we can use that. We could use that in multiple places if we wanted to. Like if we wanted to ask the user questions in multiple locations in the program, we could do that. In this example, it's not necessary but it's just cleaner to read. 
All right, so you guys kind of get the idea now. Now, if you wanted, you could even break all this logic out into its own function and call it like, you know, get answer for user if you wanted to. But I'm going to go ahead and just leave this in because we don't want to create a ton of functions. I just want to show you how they work. So now how can we improve on this program further? We've already got it to the point where if you insult it with you suck, it throws you out. We have a quit keyword so that you can actually quit out of the application if you want. What else would you want to add to this? Well, just for fun, let's give the computer the illusion that it's thinking for a little while. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So up here at the top of the program, I'm going to do something called using system.threading. Now, when you type using, all you're saying is that you want to expose all the functionality of that namespace to the code. So if I type something in the code and it exists within that namespace, it'll automatically use it. To give you just a quick example, normally I would have to type system.threading.thread.sleep if I wanted to make the computer take a nap for a second. Basically, pause the program for a period of time. But if I use that using directive, I can just do thread.sleep because it already knows the check for thread.sleep under that. You're basically just saying, I would like you to look under these areas so that I don't have to type all this out every single time I use it. That's, that's all this is. All right, so now what we're gonna do is go back down to our logic. And so where do we ask our question at? We ask our question right here. So get question from user. So right after that, all we're gonna do is we're gonna take our random number generator again and we're gonna say, give us a number between uh, zero and five. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add plus one to it. The reason being is I don't want it to return zero. And now if it returns zero, it'll add one to it and make it a one. That way, no matter what, I sleep for at least one second. So let's go ahead and store this int number of seconds to sleep. And then all we're going to do is thread dot sleep and pass in number of seconds to sleep. Oh, there's actually one little bug in the program here. Notice that when I call sleep, I pass it number of seconds to sleep. Well, sleep actually doesn't take seconds. It takes milliseconds. So we need to multiply that, which is asterisk right here, by a thousand. Now that'll give us seconds because it was saying pause for five milliseconds. So now we're saying we're converting the seconds to actual seconds from milliseconds. All right, run it. Am I the balls? Okay, thinking about your answer, stand by. Hell no. What do you think about cheese? Now notice that's not a yes or no question, but we're gonna get a yes or no answer. Now notice that answer came back a lot quicker. Each time you do it, see that one's taking a while, that one's taking a little less, that one's going, taking forever. But now you're giving the illusion that the computer's having to think about it. So you can see, you can keep building and building and building on this program. And all of these things that I'm showing you here could be adapted to make a text adventure game. Like you could put in all the ifs, like if your answer is this, then do this. If your answer is that, then do that. You, all the stuff is there to do that. All right, now we're gonna do one more thing in this lesson because I wanna show you guys how you can take that random number and use it for more than just selection. Like in this example, like you said, we saw the random number, we get that back, and then we take that random number and we use these case statements to basically convert the number to a string that gives you the illusion that you're getting an answer. All right, so now we want the console color to be something unique for each answer. So to do that, I'm just gonna say console dot foreground color equals, then in parentheses, I'm gonna do console color. Notice I'm not just typing console color, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm gonna pass it random number instead. This is a number. You can't pass a number to foreground color. It has to be a console color. But the neat thing is, just like I said, the console color is just an array of numbers. Behind those names, blue is a number, white is a number. I'm just saying pick one of those based off random number and set the foreground color to it. So if we run this, now if I ask a question, hey, am I cool? Watch what color the answer is. Okay, that was in blue. Am I still cool? It's taking a while. No, see how nose in dark blue? What's up with that? No, but now each one will be a different color. Or if you wanted to, you could actually come down here and specify which color you wanted between each set of these brackets. And it would always use that color. I just wanted to reuse the random number because I thought that that would be cool. You could also generate a new random color if you wanted because there's 15 possible console colors because there's 15 options under console color here. So let's go ahead and just get a new random number. Let's say random object dot next 15. Just give me a number. Now, when I run the program, even if it's the same answer, it could be a different color. See, we got yes. We got yes again, but it's in yellow. And now it's a new color every single time. All right, guys. Well, I think that's enough for Codegasm episode number two. I want to give you guys just enough to keep you interested, keep you moving forward, and I want to see what you guys do with it. Well, guys, that concludes episode number two of Codegasm. And I'm sorry it's so long, but oh my God, time just gets away from you. 
when you're programming. I hope you guys take the new stuff that I taught you about random number generation, switch statements, while loops, functions, classes. I want you to take all that stuff and start with what I gave you, manipulate it, and let me know what you turn it into. I really love that after the first episode, you guys sent me so many tweets over there at Barnacles and let me know what kind of changes you made to the application. And now you have a lot more tools at your disposal, so let's see how you use them. Also, don't be afraid to experiment, guys. Look around through those objects. See what, see what little functions you can run on them. See what values you can change on them. Play around with it. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can just discover by playing around. Don't be afraid. You're not gonna blow the computer up. Well, pr probably. I mean, there, there are things you could, you could do, but you're, you're not gonna find those. So once again, thanks for watching guys. I really enjoy this. If you made it to the end of this, oh my God, awful long video, go ahead and comment down below. Hashtag grape nut, G-R-A-P-E-N-U-T. Those little comments let me gauge how many people are making it to the end of these videos and lets me know if holy crap, I need to make these things shorter. Oh my God, it smells like my wife's cooking something delicious. I gotta go, bye.